Okay, so fixed assets. This came from a question. I can't remember honestly if the question was in the uh, the bulletproof bookkeeping Slack workspace or if it was in ninety seven and up. It's one of the two. It all blends together for me at this point. Um, but uh, somebody had posted, and I've seen this. I actually have a client whose balance sheet looks like this, where their fixed assets are um, grouped by year right there on the balance sheet. And to me, it's a mess. It's overkill. I understand why they do it. I, the client of mine, the reason he has it that way is because the CPA who does his taxes wants it that way. Why? Because it makes the CPA's job easy when he can look at the balance sheet and see assets right on the balance sheet by year. But to me, it's a clunky mess to deal with when, it, you know, when I'm trying to do everything else I need to do in terms of analyzing their financials. And I just think it's overkill and it's unnecessary, right? So we wanna talk about, uh, you know, just how to sort of group the fixed assets. And so I'm gonna actually pull up the QBO test drive company so we can take a look at the sample. Uh, boom. All right, everybody can see my screen here. Actually, I don't want that, nor that. QBO test drive. And what I'm gonna do also, just to use kind of a worksheet on the side is I'm gonna just pull up a Google sheet. And we're gonna kinda, of, we're gonna build something here between both. In reality, I would probably be more inclined to use a true database tool like Airtable for something like what we're gonna look at today. But since not everybody's gonna to wanna to pay 20 bucks per month per user in Airtable, Google Sheets is free. I figure I'll show you that way. And then if anybody's interested, let me know and I can certainly do a follow-up session on, uh, on what this would look like using Airtable. So um, let's go to the balance sheet. Mm, 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 mm. All right, do we have, we, so we have fixed assets, right? So here we have truck and they show original cost, right? And I imagine this is a way of segregating the original cost from any accumulated depreciation if you wanted to be that specific about it. The truth is the tax return has a nice detailed schedule that's gonna show you each asset and what its you know, original cost was and what its cumulative depreciation is up till now and what the current year's depreciation is that's gonna be taken, or if it was section 179, right? The schedule on the tax return lays that all out beautifully. And it's only in a pretty rare case that I wanna track depreciation in a, on a basis other than tax basis. For the most part, all I ever wanna do is use the tax basis method of depreciation. In other words, I'm gonna get the depreciation entries from whoever did the taxes, because they're gonna use their MACRS method of depreciation, which MACRS, M-A-C-R-S, stands for Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System, right? Um, <laughs> Josh says makers. MACRS, M-A-C-R-S. Right? Oh, you pronounce it makers? I pronounce it MACRS. Potato, if, potato. Everybody in the uh, tax world says makers. I don't, well, I don't like people in the tax world. <laughs> so no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I always well. called it macros. That's interesting. Um, so it's MACRS, stands for Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System. And it's generally going to be a faster rate of depreciation than what you'd normally do with, let's say, straight line, right? Now, the only reason, and I want to clarify this because I think it's very important, the only reason I might have a separate basis of depreciation on my financial books versus my taxes is because I might want to use a slower method of depreciation because it kind of, um, it, it um, what do you call it? it? If I want my balance sheet to look better, frankly, if I know that I've got investors potentially looking at my books to buy the company or, or I want to go on Shark Tank or whatever it is, and I want my balance sheet to look better, um, then I might wanna use a slower method of depreciation because that slows the rate at which I eat away at my assets, right? And it books the expenses later instead of sooner, right? Cause then I'm depreciating it and taking that expense in smaller chunks over years. And so that's going to help my ratios, right? It's going to make my quick ratio look better. My current ratio look better. So certain ratios where I'm comparing assets to liabilities they're gonna look better if I use slower methods of depreciation. So that's the only reason I might wanna have a different method of depreciation on my financial books versus tax, right? And if you do that, remember, you're gonna create an, some extra work for the CPA or EA. 
and that's probably going to there's going to be a cost associated with that because now they have to do their adjustments to you know basically get from the books to the taxes right so just bear that all in mind it's not something you ever want to do unless there's a really good reason for doing it right so generally speaking you're just going to use the tax basis for depreciation methods now uh, so again i wouldn't even go to this level of detail here's what i like to do in terms of setting up the fixed assets section first of all structurally i'm going to go into the chart of accounts Okay, and we want, it's really, you want to use the same sort of uh, general categorizations that you'll see on the tax return. Josh, what's the schedule that shows the depreciation? What schedule is it? 4562. 4562? All right. Like so it's, it's the depreciation schedule you want that lists the assets individually. Right. So I'm going to create a new fixed asset account here. Okay. And... Here they have the detail type. As I've often mentioned, the detail type is a very little consequence, but as long as it's here, might as well do it because you never know. It might, it, there might be a way that it becomes useful at some point in the future, right? So, and so you can kind of use this as a guide too. So we probably want one category for furniture. I'm not going to call it fixed asset furniture. I'm just going to call it furniture. A lot of times you'll see furniture and fixtures, right? What's a fixture? Like a light fixture? It could be a light fixture or a post or no yeah. it's like a, it's like when you have a stores you have shelves and things like that mm -hmm. so we're going to create furniture and fixtures okay and i did save and new because now i want to create another one and i want to do like usually there's machinery and equipment you can do computers let's do computers well i think computers these days well you might show it and then you're going to section 179 it in most cases for computers right um, especially if you're in a place where you, you want the deductions to lower your tax liability, all right? If you buy computers like you and Matthew, then it's definitely a fixed asset. For other people, it might just be an expense. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, look, the general, the general rule that I've always followed is if I spend more than 500 on it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to capitalize and depreciate it. And even if I know we're going to do section 179, you still have to put it on the balance sheet as an asset and then make the election and then record the depreciation entry for section 179, right? Well, so that's... Actually, these days, you don't even have to do 179 uh, for a, any of this, uh, you know, computers and stuff. Mm -hmm. you, you can, you just take it out, just uh, a regular expense under anything under $2,500. Mm-hmm. So there's no need to, you don't even have to show um, uh, on balance sheet or you don't even have to show on the tax return that uh, it goes through the depreciation schedule whatsoever. You just put it on a regular expense. Gotcha. So a lot, a lot of time, we just, uh, anything, any, any, any piece of equipment under $2,500, it just now just goes under direct you know, office expense or just a small tools or whatever you want to call it, you know? Gotcha. Okay, One fair enough. That, um, though, is you have to have a written policy in place and you have to file your tax return on time to qualify for that safe harbor method to deduct anything under 2,500. Right. When you say on time, if you file for a timely extension, does that qualify, Josh? Yes. Yes, it does. It's only, it's only if you don't file extension and you file late return. But I, I don't know, I still haven't heard anything. Iris is not coming back on any, anybody on that anyway right now. So that, that... Gotcha. So what was the threshold? What, you said 2,500? Yeah, so, so for a small business, it's 2500 And if somebody is, uh, what do you call it, um, somebody has audited a statement, they actually have a $5,000 threshold. Gotcha. Interesting. All right. So there's a, a high threshold in terms of things we can uh, just book straight to expenses and not have to worry about this. All right. So um, let me see where we're at with this. Um, I thought it was going to tell me that. Go away, accounting pros. Um, all right, so where's my fixed assets now? Where'd they go? Here they are. So I've got, um, see it does have truck and then it wants you to show like depreciation and original cost. This just won't go away, will it? Um, where'd my fixed assets go? Am I losing my mind? Let me refresh, maybe I need to refresh. They all depreciated. Yeah. 
Oh, here they are. Okay, I think I did need to refresh. All right, so we've got the major sort of asset categories that we want to use when we're recording stuff. And I'm looking in the chat. Tina says 2500 is a lot to book as an expense for the small business. In most small business cases, we just want the deduction because we want to limit the amount of taxes we have to pay, right? So, I mean, if you spent 2500 on something, it's, it's actually to your benefit to expense it all, you know, because again, you, you're looking for the write-off more than anything else. You can put it on the balance sheet and you can depreciate it more slowly. That's going to increase the amount of net income, which you're paying taxes on, you know, that year. Um, and the reality is, even if you already know you're, let's say, you're going to run at a loss this year, so you might be thinking, well, then I want to capitalize it, you know, to get the deduction later. You can carry losses forward, right? How many years forward can I go on an S Corp, Josh? What? Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. How many years can I carry a loss forward on an S Corp? I'm going to say it's... I thought it was I thought it was three back five forward something like that. I, I think it's three back five forward too, but I don't know absolutely. They took away the back and then they reinstated it again recently too. I okay. Think. Imran so, might know that better than me too. I don't deal with. Yeah, that. the back uh, the the back actually they only uh, they just recently did it when under the new uh, what do you call it? But that's temporary. The going back is only temporary. It's not it's not a permanent feature. So going okay. going forward, you have it. For how long? How long can you carry forward? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Honestly, I, I cannot tell you off. Of, okay. Uh, All right. But bottom line is if you're worried about the write-off that comes from not, you know, capitalizing something, you know, creating a loss that you, more of a loss um, that you might not, you know, get the benefit from, you'll get the benefit from it because you can carry those losses forward. So if next year you have a big profit, you can carry those losses forward and it'll reduce the amount of taxes you owe. So either way, you're going to get the benefit of it now or later, right? Um, as long as you don't keep running at losses so that you kind of, you know, the losses expire at some point. Um, uh, and speaking of, and I'll mention this since Josh mentioned it in the chat, we have a, a webinar coming up on September 11th uh, that Josh is going to be giving called Everything You Need to Know About S-Corps. And we, we, we had the benefit of having Josh present it to us in 97 and up. And it's, a, it's, it's just jam-packed with really useful information. So I encourage all of you to, uh, uh, to sign up for that. Okay, just, just an update. It's there is no limit of carrying forward. There's no limit. Interesting, very interesting. But the only thing, is, the only only limit is you can you can only offset eighty percent of the uh, income. Gotcha. So you can't you can't zero out your P and L based on a carry forward. Correct. Okay. Fair enough. And Kathy says losses depend on if you have basis can be suspended. Cool. All right, anyway, let's get into the bookkeeping part of this. So I have my major asset categories. And so let's say, given what we've just discussed here, um, I'm gonna spend like $5,000 in computers, right? Now, so that's, that's a question. If, I'm, if I buy one computer, it might be 2,500. But if I buy several and it goes over 5,000, are we looking at these individually or no, aggregated? No, it's individual. Okay. Fair enough. So let's just say I go to. So, so you can have 10 computers and you can, you can write out everything, all 10 computers. Gotcha. All right. So, so computers may not be a good example of a fixed asset category anymore. We're just not going to capitalize those ever. I mean, unless you're buying some kind of powerhouse of a machine, right? So let me uh, duplicate this so I can, well, let's, I had machinery and equipment, right? Didn't I? If you're going for a loan though, you might want to capitalize everything. Um, to show more income though. So there's advantages and disadvantages to it. Mm -hmm. All right, I must be losing my mind because I could swear I created an account, an account for machinery and equipment. So I'm just gonna go back to my chart of accounts and do that now. New fixed asset. Mm -mm 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 -mm. We don't really have a good one for that. Where's uh, other tools, equipment, I guess, maybe? I told you that I left my phone at home. And then you texted me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I went home. Um, I think somebody, Josh, you want to help me? You... I went home. Oh, All right. Got it. I got it. Um, yeah, I know about Alienware. Um, those are gaming type computers, but they're really good if you do video because they've got very good graphics cards in them. Um, and those can get very expensive. All right, so I have my machinery and equipment. That's what I wanted. So let's go machinery and equipment. 
Okay. And here's the sort of trick to this, I think, right? Is, you know, again, I don't want to have a different fixed asset account for each category for each year. It just gets ridiculous on the balance sheet. <clears throat> so when I do buy something, I want to put a very good detailed description on here. I mean, we should do that anyway, but especially with fixed assets. Um, so I want to put something like, you know, 2020 Caterpillar, you know, blah, 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 whatever model number of Caterpillar equipment I just purchased, right? And let's say I spent like 7,500 on this equipment, okay? And that's the main thing is getting this detailed description on here because then, and by the way, the reason I brought up the spreadsheet is we want to track separately the detailed information that would go on that schedule. What was it, 4592 or something? <laughs> I think I lost Josh. So I want the, typing. <laughs> that's okay. I want the date of purchase. I want to keep my own schedule here. Um, so I can track this stuff separately. So the date of purchase, um, maybe the vendor where I bought it. Okay, the amount of course, and the description. And perhaps most importantly, where should I put this here, is the fixed asset category. I'll just abbreviate. Okay, so the date of purchase, what date did I say I was purchasing that on? Uh, nine two. I love this quick search feature, by the way. So I use today's date. Let me back this up, actually. Not that it matters that much, but let's just say it was a couple months ago. All right. So date of purchase is seven one twenty. The fixed asset category is machinery and equipment. Um, actually, I think I, I set Best Buy as the vendor because I was going the route of computer equipment originally. Let's change that. So in this case, it would probably actually be Caterpillar. All right, 7,500. And the description, I will also just grab from here. So once I've done this, and it's going to get, you know, the implication of this is going to be a lot clearer when you have like a bunch of transactions. But if I now run my balance sheet and I go into machinery and equipment, I almost don't need the extra schedule because I've laid it out here in a way that it makes everything very clear, right? What I could do in the schedule that I can't easily do here, although you could in QuickBooks Online Advanced with custom fields is put in, you can, you know, you want a column per the way it's going to look on the tax return, you know, that says based on the date, you know, cumulative depreciation or accumulated, right? Okay. And then current period depreciation. So every year you'll update the accumulated, you know, by adding whatever last year's current period depreciation was, and then you'll put this year's depreciation in there. Now, some companies want to do a monthly depreciation entry. So if you're going to do that and you're sticking with the tax basis, then you'll want to get together with the tax professional who's doing the books and let them give you the calculations. Because again, they're using the modified um, accelerated cost recovery system. Um, so, uh, you're going to want the entry from them. You're not going to want to try and calculate this yourself. Um, the other thing you can do in a database kind of thing like this, and let me just call this fixed asset schedule, is just because when you're kind of reporting on this stuff, one of the things we want to see very clearly and quickly is the year of purchase, right? So I can look at the date and say, oh, it's 2020, but I want it even clearer than that. And there's a very simple formula you can use. This works in Excel or Google Sheets. Equals year, and you point to the date of purchase, right? And what this allows me to do if I'm tracking it in something like this is at the end of the year, if I've got a bunch of stuff, and by the way, this would be very easy to populate now. If you had a bunch of purchases and machinery equipment from this year, I could just drill in here the way I did right off the balance sheet 
export this to Excel, a little bit of tweaking and I can copy and paste the information right here. And then while it's in here, I could very easily, and this would be a permanent running schedule. So I might have some 2019 assets in here and otherwise. And then over here, what we wanna do is um, instead of amount, usually we'll just call this original cost, right? And then we'll just call this basis or book value, which is going to equal the original cost minus the sum of the accumulated in the current period, right? So in the first year, there's gonna be no accumulated. I'm just gonna do whatever the current period depreciation is, right? The other thing we want in here, now that I mention it, is we want the, uh, the useful life in years, right? Like, but again, you're not gonna calculate this based on straight lines, so don't use that to calculate depreciation. It's just good information to have to compare with, right? So again, Josh is gonna come to me and say, hey, you know, Seth, the, uh, here are the useful lives on these assets you purchased this year, right? So we can even put that out here. Right, so let's say this piece of Caterpillar equipment is gonna be good for 10 years, I don't know. All right, so you can keep track of something like this in a schedule like this, and it's very easy, even if you just updated it once a year at the end of the year, again, you run the balance sheet. The real trick is putting the detailed information in the memo so that things look and line up really nicely. Um, and I'm looking at the chat comments. Um, Tina says, can you paste a link to your Google Sheets somewhere in the expense record? Sure. That's one of the beauties of doing something like this in Google Sheets specifically. Um, can you, I guess you probably can get a URL for an Office 365 document to link to. I'm assuming you can. Um, so if I go in here and I just change the sharing I could leave it restricted to just me, but in case there's anybody else in the QuickBooks file that I'd want to be able to access this, I can make it view only still, you know, copy the link done and then back over here in the expense, you know, you can put it either here in the description. If I'm gonna do something like this, I'll use, this is called a pipe. It's basically the backslash key, but when you're holding down shift, it's called a pipe. It's that straight up and down line and I'll paste that link in. Somebody was just asking me, one of our newer members was just asking me about this. One of the videos in the course goes over how I use this to, you know, for linking to other transactions in QBO. And you can see it's not gonna render as a link. I wish they would fix that. Um, but you can click in here and easily copy and paste this. Or actually while it's selected, you can just right click and you'll get this option to go to that URL. And it'll take you right in there. So yep, you can absolutely do that. Um, you know, so I guess you would do this, you would put this link in on every single transaction for every fixed asset that you book, right? And that way it's just a quick way to get in there. And Linda says, this all goes for nonprofits too. Your auditor will love you. Nonprofits usually just use straight line because there are no income tax consequences. That makes sense. Um, and Josh says, if you get the depreciation schedule from the tax pro, this will all be provided like he's doing too, right? So, and the only thing is, you know, this I can sort of play with, right? So I've done that sometimes where I've gotten the depreciation schedule from the tax return and I've recreated it in a spreadsheet because this allows me to kind of play around. And I just like, I like data. I like tracking things, you know, and especially if it's a client where there is a lot of activity going on in the fixed assets section each year. Um, so we can definitely do something like that. And just so we can kind of see what this looks like, let's add a few more uh, assets in here. Um, no, I don't wanna leave that saving, save and close. Okay, so let's purchase another fixed asset. We'll stick with machinery and equipment for now because you get the idea. It's gonna show up in each of those categories. And one of the other parts of the question was for the depreciation, like do we, have separate accumulated depreciation categories. And if you're gonna use the major categories like we've started to do here, then I think it's smart to, to do the same thing with your accumulated depreciation. Because especially when the time comes, although you have the information here, and that's one of the other reasons for doing this, by the way, if you dispose of an asset, especially if you sell it, you're going to need to know how much accumulated depreciation ties to this particular asset because you're gonna to need to recapture that to, you know, to deduct its basis from the selling price to figure out the gain or loss on the disposition of that asset, right? 
So it's, you know, we're talking about some somewhat advanced stuff, but it's important. It's important. And I don't think there's anybody here who's not very capable of understanding this, right? So because we have to look at the, you know, the, the, the original cost minus the cumulative depreciation gives us that book value. That's really the basis. That's the real value of the asset. That has to be compared with the purchase price when we're disposing of it. Um, so going back into here, um, Let's see, I don't know. Josh, give me another example of something we can buy and somebody we can buy it from that we would capitalize. Vehicle for $4,600. Okay, so we're gonna do autos. So we already have, I'm not gonna use their truck category because I don't like the way they broke it down. Autos and trucks. Oh, this is the payee, duh. Hold on. So I like to create a fixed asset called autos and trucks. I don't know why the distinction in trucks, but I mean, I guess most people could figure out that trucks are a kind of auto, but we'll call that vehicles. That's fine. And save and close. So we'll get this from Toyota. They're not a sponsor. Josh, what do they call them on the tax return? Is it vehicles, autos? I don't remember, I don't remember what they kind of what the categories are that they typically ask for. It's basically just a vehicle. But it's technically, I believe it's called per, or considered personal property. Um, well, unless it's bought in the name of the business, right? No, it's just the category of asset that's hard to explain. On the 4562, um, I might be using the wrong term. Make sure. I, the reason I ask is sometimes it's helpful I found to label the account name, same name that it might be just relate to taxes if it, if it didn't have any other implications. It's listed property, sorry, not personal. Listed property is what is considered. I would just call it vehicles, it's very clear, so. Yeah, and I'm just making sure I spelled Sequoia right here. So again, this is critically important. We want it in the description. So it's very clear that this is a 2020 or if I bought it used, you know, maybe this would say 2019. I need to be able to, if an auditor came in my door and asked me and started scrutinizing what's in here, I need them to be able to point to this entry and I can go out on the lot and show them exactly which truck it is, right? If you really wanted to get put like a VIN number, I would say. I, mean, I was just about to say, you can put a VIN number if you want to get really crazy with it. Yep. That was literally going to be my next sentence out of my mouth. <laughs> um, so, all right. What do we spend on one of these? Let's call it 40,000. I don't know. Okay. And we'll say that this was bought back in the middle of July or something, right? Um, and keep in mind, this entry would actually be a fair bit more complicated than this because we would have to deal with all the DMV and registration and all the other stuff. I'm keeping it simple for illustrative purposes today. Um, uh, I got a question. Would I ever want to input the original cost and as of date when adding the new account? No. I never use that stuff in setting up accounts because it's going to stick it into opening balance equity, which as we've gone over in prior webinars, I don't like to use that account at all anymore. In cases where I would need to use it, I've started to use something called prior period adjustments, which is classified in the other expenses section of the P&L, right? And that way it goes through the P&L and closes out properly to ultimately to retained earnings, right? Um, so no, I never like to use those beginning balances, even when I'm setting up inventory that somebody might have contributed into the business. I prefer to get those set up, you know, through an entry, um, you know, where I can be very specific about that. So, <clears throat> so I don't like to use that. Uh, Kathy says, I have a client that replaces trucks every 75,000 miles. Are they leasing them or are they, you know, actually buying them? <laughs> That's what I'd be curious about. They actually buy them. Wow. And it's, it creates a huge loss in almost every couple of years. Okay. I mean, is there a benefit? Like, are they getting any kind of ROI on that by not like letting the trucks get too old? Yeah, he just doesn't like to drive old trucks and he just wants to, re he wants to keep some resale value. He just, uh, he's just a little bit uppity. He just wants to have new cars all the time. I would just lease them for three years. That's what I started doing is I said, instead of buying and financing, I'm just going to lease cars. So every three years I can get a new one. He has a little farm on his, by his house. I see. Okay. Fair enough. 
So again, the key to this stuff is going to be having a nice detailed description. As Kelly brought up, you know, we can put the VIN number here, right? And once again, we're going to want to grab the share link to our schedule here. Uh, another, uh, so the, for the VIN number, it's going to be blah, 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 some really long, ridiculous number. It looks like I'm cursing at people now. And then I'm just going to paste the uh, URL in there. I want to try something. I like doing stuff like this just to keep it neat. Although I do, I'll admit, this is totally just my OCD. This makes me crazy when it kind of wraps the text around to new lines and then I have different sized rows. This just, I had a rough toilet training as a kid. Okay, let's just leave it at that. So that kind of thing makes me nuts. But, um, but I do like the fact that you can, you know, just kind of use these separators. It would be so cool if they allowed like rich text formatting in these description boxes. That would put me in heaven. I have to send that feedback to them. Like I would, I would make lots of videos for Intuit for free if they did that for me. And um, the what? And the links. Yeah, and the, and the well, yeah, theoretically, <coughs> if there was rich text formatting, that would include hyperlinks rendering as such. Um, all right, so let's put this, so now let's fill in, well, let's save it. Okay. Now, so these are gonna be in separate fixed asset sections, right? Because I have autos and trucks here, machinery and equipment but I can click into the total fixed assets thing, right? Let me see what they did here in their example. And this is even done with a journal entry using the opening balance. Again, it just kills me. I'm deleting this. I don't like it. It's kind of fun to pick on the sample company. But now, so now what I want to be able to do again, because I want kind of a concise report that shows me here are all the new fixed assets from this year, right? And I want to show you how it's laid out very nicely when you take the time to record things the way I'm showing you. So if I click on the total fixed assets number here, it's going to group it by account, but I don't have to leave it that way. Up here where it says group by, I can change this to none. I have a column which tells me the account, right? So I still have that here. <clears throat> And again, with a quick export, and by the way, QuickBooks Online Advanced, there's an option to export straight to Google Sheets. For those who, like me, love Google Sheets, it's a nice thing to have. And then we're gonna want to update our schedule with this new asset. So let's just go ahead and do the export. In this case, it's to Excel, oh well. It's basically, I call this like a throwaway file. I'm gonna just use it for a minute to copy and paste the information over to Google Sheets and then I'm gonna throw it away. All right, so 715, Alt-Tab, Paste Special Values, 715. Copy my formula down, it grabs my year. The Fixed Asset Category, right there under account now, right? Autos and trucks. And I can actually, if I just paste it, it, it carries the formatting with it. So that's why I use the paste values only option. Uh, the vendor was Toyota. I'll just type that at this point. The original cost was 40. All right, the description over here. Although in this case, I don't need the whole link thing. So let's, we can widen our formula bar, just like you can do in Excel. And I'm just gonna delete all the extra stuff I don't need. All right, and then this probably came in with like wrap text formatting. Or I just have an extra character in there, there we go. All right, and then we can copy that down. And then Josh is gonna tell me the useful life of a Toyota Sequoia is what, five years? Perfect. Five years. All right, by the way, another cool thing we can do in Google Sheets <clears throat> with these dates is I'm gonna validate the formatting. So first we'll go format, and the date formats are inside the number formatting, but it's got the ones I frequently do here. Typically I like the double digit format all the way across so that it lines up nicely no matter what. But also while I've got this range selected, we're gonna go to data and we're gonna go to validation. And the criteria is gonna be a date 
and then the first choice is fine. It's a valid date. That's what we're looking for and save. And what that now does is when I click in here, if I double click, it gives me a little calendar pop up so I can pick my dates. Just a cool little thing you can do with Google Sheets. Um, <clears throat> so now you can start to see how this gets, you know, a little practical in terms of, you know, taking the time to get the information in there. Use the major categories that you would use to describe them on the tax return as your accounts in the fixed assets section, right? And then what we'll want to do is in QuickBooks, it's probably fine to just book, you know, when you book the depreciation entry, debit whatever the depreciation expense for all the machinery and equipment stuff and credit accumulated depreciation machinery and equipment. Do the same for each of these major categories. You don't need it broken down by asset in QuickBooks. You have this schedule for that, right? The most important thing though is when you do the current period depreciation is that for any given category like machinery and equipment, you just wanna make sure your schedule here that has it divided up by asset adds back to the same total that you're posting in QuickBooks. It's a double check and it's a really good way to make sure <clears throat> that the books A are in 100% agreement with the tax return and B, now I have the good detailed information in the right place. You know, I always say it's the right tool for the right job. This is the right tool for the job of tracking the sort of um, the minute details of all my fixed assets because in here, now I can easily, I can, I can use a pivot table. There's all kinds of things I can do where I can just turn on filters and say, show me only the machinery and equipment stuff. So I can use something like this to quickly and easily analyze my fixed asset schedules, right? What was that in reference to Josh that you said you thought you were the only one that lazy? Oh, I'll download something or copy and paste something because I don't want to retype it. So <laughs> yeah, no, I hate typing things. First of all, typing things lends itself to error. So copying and pasting is more bulletproof. <laughs> and I'm not even kidding about that, right? Because if I, especially if I try to type Sequoia three times, I'll probably spell it three different ways each time. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, that's the main gist of what I wanted to show everybody here today is in terms of tracking fixed assets. The, the key takeaways again should be the account categories matching the major categories the way they would be grouped on the tax return <clears throat> and using good detailed memo descriptions on each purchase so that when you run a report like this and you want to dump it into Excel or your, you know, or the EA or CPA, you know, needs it, they can even drill in, right? And they, it's just, they're going to, I think somebody posted early in the chat, they're going to love you for doing it this way because you're making their job easy. And you know what happens when you make the job of the tax prep professional easy? Because a lot of their existing clients, bookkeepers don't make their jobs easy. Guess who they're gonna think of the next time they need somebody's help cleaning up a set of books, right? This is when I've gone out there and created a lot of the marketing materials for the Bulletproof Bookkeeping course, I pushed that concept pretty strong that if you learn how to keep books the way that I'm showing you, you're going to get referrals from guys like Josh all day long because it, he never sees it this nice and neat and no, easy. It's an extra charm for your customer cheaper too because it, it's 10 times easier. So Heather's asking, could I add another vehicle and then do a sample journey? Oh, sure. Um, I'll add another vehicle. We got time. I'm glad you asked. All right, so let's go buy a new vehicle, new expense. And this one we'll do on the 30th. Okay, we'll buy another Toyota Sequoia. Um, yeah, sure, why not? And then what did we end up doing on this one? This was a 2019, <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry. So this one, we're gonna do a 2020. And it's going to be like 60,000. I think Sequoias are actually more on the order of 60,000 anyway. They're pretty big SUVs. Um, all right, so we'll do that. All right, so now I've got it here. Autos and trucks, machinery and equipment. So impact to grouping, let's just say none. Okay. And so I'll just add that one in here. That one I'll just do quickly manually. So July 30th, um, the year of purchase is 2020. The category is autos and trucks. Oops, not there. There, 60. 
All right, and then actually I took all the same information here except just make this 2020. All right, obviously the VIN number would be different. Okay, and then copy that down. While we're here, let's just format currency for currency. And we'll assume the same useful life on this one, right? So now what's gonna happen is we're gonna get to December, <clears throat> right, or January of next year. And Josh is gonna look over these books or Imran's gonna look over these books to start getting the tax return ready. <clears throat> at a certain point, they're gonna say, okay, do we have any new fixed assets that we have to do the depreciation for, right? And assuming this is the case and this is all that's on the books, then Josh is gonna give me a depreciation entry. And you know, he might even, this is gonna happen, Josh probably wouldn't do this, but a lot of people will just send you one entry, debit depreciation for this amount, credit accumulated depreciation for the same, right? So if they do that, you wanna go back to them and say, please break this down by asset category right? So that I have the depreciation amount for autos and trucks separately. And I have the depreciation amount for machinery and equipment separately, right? Ask them, insist on that. They'll appreciate that you're actually being detailed about things. I can't imagine anybody's going to get mad at you for, uh, for asking for that. Um, <clears throat> or Josh says in the chat, just ask for the depreciation schedule if you can get it. Um, so, Josh, how much am I depreciating? I've got 107,500 in new assets we purchased this year, right? 100,000 of which is in autos and trucks, 7,500 of which is machinery and equipment. So I'm going to start preparing the journal entry that will post. Josh is going to give me the number. You don't have to actually look it up, Josh. You can just make I was it saying, up. I'm going to know your income first and what your goals are before I can make that decision. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because you can choose different... Uh, rates of accelerate of, of okay got it all right so this we would be posting on december 31st right and we're going to have depreciation dash autos and trucks not rucks okay and that's going to be where are you expenses and i'm sure there's a depreciation option in here Gotta be. Okay, that's weird. Josh, what am I missing? Sorry, he's answering chats. Um, oh, it's interesting. They want you to put in other expense, which actually makes sense. It should be. Most people put this in the general expenses, but it should be in other expense. I don't know if that's always been the case or if that's a more recent change, because I had always found it. I thought, anyway, I'm glad they're doing this because it should fall below the line. It should be in the other expenses section. And where that comes from, by the way, is if you've ever, you've probably, um, many of you are probably familiar with this. Some of you may not be, but you've probably all heard the term at least, you know, EBITDA, EBITDA, which stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, which basically means we want to see net income at the bottom of the P&L before any of that. So, which means interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization should all be other expenses on any set of books. It's often not classified properly that way, but this is the right way to do it. Um, all right, so other expenses, depreciation. Uh, I'll just save and close that. And then I want depreciation eh, for machinery and equipment. Okay, and now I know it's an other depreciation. And then we want accumulated depreciation, which are gonna be fixed assets for the same two categories, right? And sometimes you just abbreviate it like AD, but let's just spell it out just in case somebody doesn't know what that stands for. I can't type today. All right, so this is also going to be a fixed asset. And I'll, the other thing we'll probably want to do, which I'm not going to do right now in the interest of time, is group 
each of these uh, fixed asset and accumulated depreciation as sub accounts under a parent so that it lays out very nicely on the balance sheet, right? Um, so this is autos and trucks. I thought we had one for autos here, fixed asset. Um, that's crazy. How do we not have one for autos? I don't remember what I called it when I did the fixed asset uh, originally. Um, ah. Go all the way down. I think there's something that says vehicle. Did you go all the way? Oh, I there it is. Thank you, vehicle. Courtney. You're welcome. <laughs> I thought I'd seen something for it. Um, all right, save and close. And then because I'm lazy, I'm gonna take this whole thing and copy it. And then I'm gonna go back up here and do m and &E for machinery and equipment. And we're gonna do, um, no, what am I doing? Fixed assets. And this one we had, uh, I think other tools or equipment is what I ended up using. So save and close. All right, so Josh, give me the depreciation amounts. Uh, do five thousand. Oh, I do two autos. Let's just do ten thousand. I get even number. Equipment was more expensive, right? So uh, let's do twenty thousand. I think they okay. like seventy-five hundred. I'm just on random numbers. Yeah, you know what though? The realistically, a, ca a piece of Caterpillar equipment is going to be more like seventy-five thousand. So. Either way, the idea is the journal entry layout, right? We're debiting the depreciation expense for each category in its respective amount, and we're crediting the corresponding accumulated depreciation accounts, of course, for the same exact amounts, right? So when I save this, and then we'll tweak the chart of accounts, how am I not balanced? What do you, oh. And something I do, which you might be getting to, is I copy the asset into the description, so that way I know which one it pertains to. Well, that's if you were doing the depreciation s separately for each asset, yeah? Or you said- I'll do it Per asset. So if we have vehicle and equipment, I'll copy the, the vehicle name and put it there so that way. Okay, so what I normally do is I would just take all the depreciation for that one category and post it as a single line. I don't necessarily break it out by asset in QuickBooks. I figure we have that here, but I see what you mean. It's, yeah, it's just, ways. I like to do it um, one by one. Right, okay. So Better. in in that case, what we would do in the case of the autos, because we had two of them, let's go back into the journal entry, is this just gets broken down into two lines. Do you also break it up on the accumulated side? Yeah. Um, it depends. I mean, I have sets of books where we lump it and then I have sets of books where I break it down. So you use the same account, but you just, right? It's the same account, but you just put the description of each asset on its own line with its corresponding. Okay, that makes sense. Because then you can sort, I mean, I don't think you can sort by name, which makes no sense in QuickBooks to me, but you can sort by other fields and try to group them together to, to get the data. Right. And if you catch a mistake, because maybe you did too much depreciation or did something incorrectly. Um, right. Isolate why. So. Got it. So we'd have the Sequoia and the other Sequoia, right? Not to say that there's a right or wrong way for this. No, there obviously isn't. It's just a matter of getting the details that you want. And, and all of this is really, if it's not already obvious, about what you can get out of it later on, right? And it's and that's the thing. It's so tempting in the moment, especially when you're trying to do eight thousand things, to brush by this and say, oh, "I'll go back in and put the details in later." And we all know how that works, right? It's never going to happen. So, my experience is, if I take the time now, slow down a little bit, put in the details, I'll thank myself later. I always do because I end up, you know, feeling like all right, I'm so glad I took the time to do that because it's going to save you time later on. That's like my golden rule of productivity is anything I'm doing, if I put in the extra time up front now, it's almost always going to save me a lot of time later on, especially because down the road, I have no independent recollection of what I was doing right now in the moment when I'm doing it, it's is the best time to, uh, you know, to, to flush out all the details might as well. It's, and it's not a lot of extra time and trouble to go to, all right? So now if I push the date of this balance sheet out to December 31st and run it, you will see there's my accumulated depreciation 
and the original fixed asset. So now if we restructure the chart of account sum, we can put these together. Unfortunately, because accumulated starts with an A alphabetically, accumulated depreciation, which is the negative amount, is frequently going to land on top of the actual asset. Um, so you can think about different ways you can sort of tweak that. The problem is you also want to make sure it's going to come up nicely in a search and a drop down when you're trying to pick the account to be used in a transaction. So here's what I would do to kind of address that. So first of all, I need another new fixed asset account for auto and truck. And I'll just put a little P in there for now so that I know that's the one that's meant to be the parent account, right? Um, I hate when it does that. Certain accounts do that. When you change the detail type, it renames it. Fine, you know what, I'll stick with that because that way it's a different name than autos and trucks and save and close. Okay, and then now I'm gonna go find auto and make this a sub of vehicles, save and then uh, other expenses not going there. I have accumulated depreciation autos. That's what needs to go in. Vehicles. And what I may do to push this down to the bottom of the section instead of it being at the top is I'm going to put like an X yes. and a space dash space. Yep. Right. And then the reason why is this for sure will still come up when I pull it up. And if I start typing accumulated or even depreciation, the name will still come up in a drop down. Right. And we'll test that to be sure, of course. So now if I go back to my balance sheet. And we have to push the date out to December. You can see how nicely that lays out, right? I've got vehicles, autos and trucks, depreciation, net book value on the vehicles is 90,000, right? It just looks really smooth. And now let's test my theory about being able to call this account up. We're gonna usually be using that account in a journal entry. So I wanna make sure that if I pull up accumulated, there it is. So the X just makes it fall to the bottom alphabetically. So it lays out nicely. You know, the other way, of course, I'm sure somebody's thinking this is we could use account numbers. I just hate using account numbers. I don't, I know some people like them. So it's not, you know, it doesn't mean you're doing it wrong or anything. It's just, I hate them. They make me nuts. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Any questions? Let's look in the chat. I have two, if there's time. <laughs> All right, go for it. One, um, for, the, for the fixed assets, um, I do two subcategories, one fixed asset, one accumulated depreciation is on the tax return. This is what I'm matching it to mm -hmm. is I want the total accumulated depreciation and total. Oh, so you have a separate section for fixed assets versus accumulated depreciation on the balance. Yeah, that's smart. I like that. But my other question is what happens, and I've had this happen and I don't like what I've done in the past and I might have had a solution for it, but what happens if you buy a big asset but use two different payment methods? I don't want to see two lines that equal one asset. I just want to see one asset. Mm. So I thought I could do a journal entry and then put the two payment methods in the journal entry so it matches to that. I would use a clearing account. Use a, use a clearing account as a bank account. Write a check out of that clearing account for the full amount of the cost. And then when the actual two different payments based on the two payment methods go through that same clearing account. So the clearing account will zero out, but this way you have one nice entry for the total of the asset. Yeah, that, would, that would probably work better than the journal entry too for keeping I don't like doing journal entries unless I really need to. I just couldn't think of another method. So I thought yeah. you would, oh, awesome. I love clearing accounts because they make it so, it's, it's a perfect way if I need to group things like that. And that, that's what I use them for. I use clearing accounts all the time. They're the best, I love them. I wanna marry them. Good old clearing account. That's what gets me excited on a Friday night. Anything else? No other questions? Comments, feedback? Anybody need therapy? I can't help you with that. All right then, I will get the recording posted as soon as possible. And uh, hope to see you Friday.
we have a nice little uh, exciting Zoom planned for Friday morning, 8 a.m. Pacific time. And don't forget, September 11th, Josh is giving the Everything You Need to Know About S-Corps webinar. And for those of you who aren't already in 97 and up, there's an opportunity, if you're checking out for that, to get a free month of 97 and up and try it out and see if you like it. So there's that. Um, talk to you all soon. Thanks, Seth.